OK, um, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us on a lovely um, sunny afternoon. I'm Philip Oldfield. I'm head of school here at UNSW Built Environment. It's a pleasure to welcome you today. We're gathered on Bejigal land. I'd like to pay my respects to elders, both past and present, and extend that respect to any First Nations peoples who are joining us either in person or online today. This is a new series of talks that we have organised called Impact at BE. The aim of these talks really is to celebrate the research our staff and students are doing, and in particular the research they're doing with industry. We do so many different types of research, publish papers, uh, reports, um, ARC grants and so much more. But what we're really interested in is actually changing the built environment for the better. And hopefully throughout these series of talks, everyone's going to get a insight into some of the way our research is actually impacting industry, actually hitting the ground. Um, I would like to thank Elisa Palazzo, who has organised these talks. Um, and we're going to have them every, every few weeks throughout the year. Today's talk is going to look at the ARC Training Centre of Next Gen Architectural Manufacturing, and I'd like to Welcome our three speakers, Associate Professor Hank Ausler, who is the director of the centre, Dr. Ivana Kuzmanowska, and I hope I pronounced that right, Ivana, and Emeritus Professor Alex Sands, who are going to talk you through the centre now. So without further ado, over to you all. Thank you, Phil as well for that warm welcome and let me go to the next slide. Thank you. It changes here but it doesn't change there. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, here we go. See my old skilled in media architecture helps sometimes. So my name is Henk Heusler. I'm the ARC Training Center Director for the ARC Center for Next Gen Architecture Manufacturing. I also would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of this land and their elders past, present and future. Um, let me quickly go through the ARC Center to give an overview to the audience here in the um, BE Gallery and online what the ARC Center is and what we do. So the ASC Centre has um, several industry partners. We've got two main universities here in Australia, UNSW as the lead um, university and Swinburne as the other partner university. We've got six industry partners and I'd be very honoured today to have Alex Sands as one of the industry partners in that BE Impact Lecture Series. We've got four institutional partners, Peak Bodies, that represents architects outside of the industry partners um, in a broader spectrum, so all the architects in the country. And we've got four international partners, very established universities and esteemed universities in Europe um, as well. What do we care in the center? Well, we care about six things. We've got six goals that we'd like to address in the center, and they're behind here. These are really problems that the architecture, engineering, and construction industry is, is facing and we contribute to. We reduce, we produce or use too much resources. Most of the resources on planet Earth are used for building cities, building infrastructure, and we cannot continue like that in the future. We use too much waste, we produce too much waste. Most of the waste is produced again by the construction industry, um, so effectively by us here in the people in this faculty or the people we educate in this faculty. And we also emit too much carbon. So these are kind of three issues we are concerned on. Other issues we're concerned on in the total six is delivering projects on time. Um, most projects, most large projects are not delivered on time. Most large projects are not delivered within budget. It's a massive kind of issue. So if you waste kind of time and budget, you probably also have problems with the other three issues. And we also have an issue with delivering the benefits we promise. And I think all six items are very, very close related to each other. 
And that's what we try to address in the center's work. So how do we address these things? Behind me here, you can see a first graph that outlines um, our idea of how the center is working. So on the one side, we've got the academic partners. They're just going to work on a research side with the, the research problems I outlined before. On the other side, more on the training, you've got the institutional partners that help us to, to, to bring the research that we've developed in the center to a widespread of uh, architects in the country. And then lastly, we've got on the bottom through seven PhD, uh, 21 PhD students and three postdoc fellows, um, the connection to our industry partners to address the problem. So the mandates in our ARC center are quite clear. We have um, these PhD students to train. We've got PhD um, training to complete. We've got 156 CPD courses for training of architects and the architecture sector to complete. Um, and we also have to publish papers, 81 journal articles as well. So we do so in three different themes. There's the theme of synthesis, management, analytics. And those kind of three themes really relate to the, the application of the grant architectural manufacturing. In the grant, we argue that manufacturing and production of something could only be improved if you look into the post-production and the pre-production. So in literature, in manufacturing, and the, the, the argument from the Australian government to focus on manufacturing was productivity and efficiency improvements could be only made in the pre- and the post-production. And we said, well, pre-production is what we do. Pre-production is R&D, design, logistics, and R&D and design is very clearly what we do here in the, the center. So there's a very strong theme synthesis in the pre-production part that we focused on with seven PhD students and one postdoc fellow. In the post-production part, we've got distribution, sales, and services. And here we argue that the, the service of a building is actually what, what, the, what architects do. Architects don't really design buildings and build them per se, that's the builder's job. But the service is what we do in our drawings, our documentations. So every architecture firm has terabytes of information on their server. And these terabytes of information describe the biography of the building from its first idea to its handover. So in this data, you've got email exchange, you've got Word documents, you've got photos, you've got number calculations, you've got 3D models. And this complete package um, allows us to, to understand what has happened in the design, what kind of problems occur in the design. So what kind of problems occur in terms of carbon, in terms of waste, in terms of resources, in terms of time, budget, and benefits. And if you can extract this information out of these data, we potentially have a feedback loop again to the pre-production to inform future projects better. There's the last element we're going to look into is the business side of architecture. Every architecture firm produces architecture with a capital A, the buildings you see. But it's also a business that needs to operate, that needs to hire people, that needs to deploy resources. And I can see a huge opportunity there to really look into a how is an office run, what is the practice of a practice, but also looking into what are future opportunities for the business model in the 21st century. What are digital threats or digital transformation opportunities exist in architecture firms and how you can respond to new, new ways of practice, new ways of work, new ways of learning, of engagement, cultural change, operational change. So these are in a nutshell the, the topics of the center. Sorry. having luck here. So if you want to hear more from me and from others, from my colleague and LC Center Manager Ivana, our um, center partners from Swinburne, Mark and Jane Burry, feel free to vote for us in the South by Southwest um, festival that is happening next year, where we've got an event as well. Um, currently, they've been looking for votes for events, so it would be great if you could vote for us um, and then see more of what we do in the South by Southwest Festival in Sydney. So I'd like to hand over to, to Alex Sands and just Alex needs only little introduction, 
Um, he's a good friend of the faculty. Um, he was the, the dean when I came here. Um, he was responsible for employing me and also responsible and had the foresight of starting the computational design degree. So I'm going to hand over to Alex so he can say a few words about his practice. Thank you. Well, if Hank can't change his screen, I've got Buckley's chance. <laughs> Press the button. Oh, there you go. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, Hank and Ivana, for inviting me. Um, of course, we're the smallest of the industry partners, but uh, hearing Hank uh, once again present uh, what your mission is and what you're doing is really inspirational. And without, without sort of uh, going over it, I can say we align with those visions and the ways in which we or you can contribute to a better world through the work we do at the front end of this process particularly, but also pleasingly uh, engaging with, as you said, the practice of the practice, uh, or if you like, the workplace environment. Um, I won't speak very long for those who don't know what we do. I think we could say fairly confidently that we are known for some fairly large scale urban design projects. So we're currently doing four, as, as, as urban design leads, four um, state significant projects which are transformational and challenging. And we're also advising on two others. And we're also known for our place specific architecture and our interest in lowering carbon through through what we can do in both the design side and the operational construction and operational side um, and our design interests are also at product level as well as at the building level and the urban level um, why did we join well partly because um, what you do um, really guides what we do um, and being involved with uh, leading academic work is one of the privileges of being, uh, I call ourselves finishers. We, we tend to be the, the end part of the process, or for some people the start of the construction process, but nevertheless in some ways uh, we're on the ground uh, do, designing things which get built. So we, we don't necessarily generate new knowledge, not academically leading knowledge. We may have other practical knowledge. And we need to be on top of what is going on to be um, improve what we do. And that has a couple of dimensions. One of them is the internal dimension where we, we try and create a progressive feeling to the practice, a feeling that we're motivated by what you're motivated by and we're doing something about it through the work you do. Now, we also want to improve our workflows because We'd like to spend more time analyzing and, and designing, being creative, um, and less time doing the mundane work. And also, I think we need to be able to put some evidence behind uh, what we do to the outside world when we are competing uh, quite in, a, in, in quite a competitive environment. I think Sydney is possibly one of the most competitive global environments for the practice of design in the world at the moment, because we've, we've got work for a start. And so we need to be able to distinguish ourselves in alignment with our values and with the um, role we have to transfer the knowledge you create into something that we can do to help others. And uh, I think that um, in my life, there's three generations of transformative technologies in how we do things. Um, I'm the old school, um, obviously analog. Uh, also early days microstation, and we have still people in the practice who are microstation, we still run it. And of course we're now 3D Revit and BIM and all those sorts of things. And it'll change again, and all of that's improving. Um, and I think that the other side of it that I think is important that you touched on is our people and how they enjoy their work and how we engage with each other, how we can collaborate more efficiently, how we can have more aligned uh, knowledge bases to be able to work effectively together. Um, and all the aspects of uh, remuneration and, um, if you like, uh, the, the complex 
business of winning work, all those things are a very important part of what we do and influence the built environment as well. So they're my, my brief thoughts. Thank you. Hello. Um, so we thought that we'd run this session uh, in two halves. So presentation introducing you to the center and, and to Zans and what they do. And then a panel discussion where I might ask my two guests here <laughs> to speak a little bit about um, the collaboration and what the center, hopefully how the center will impact industry over the coming years. So I might start maybe with a question for Hank um, and get you to speak a little bit about the kind of genesis of your collaborative relationship with Alec and with Sans, the firm. Thank you. Yeah, as I mentioned before, um, Alec was the dean here, so uh, he knows probably quite well what I'm doing um, and what the computational design degree was doing. And the, the interest of the computational design degree was always solving practice-based problems. So the graduation studio, but also the education of the degree was very much focused on, on practice problems. So can you bring certain issues of concerns of the practice um, into the teaching, but then also later to the graduation project into practice? So I think the computation science degree was really the, the, the seed of the ARC center because A, we understood what practice problems are, and B, we would, would understand um, that through a partnership how to, to negotiate and how to contact um, industry partners in terms of convincing them during the pandemic three times to commit um, funding to an ARC application. Because you, before you go to the center, you obviously have to uh, uh, um, apply for the center, you have to apply three times. And um, with that kind of background, I just um, approached Alec then in 2019, probably, or earlier 2018. For the first time, if the idea could be develop an ARC training center at that time it was an ARC research hub, um, and and started the discussion on what issues exist in the firm, what what could we investigate, what what are the pressing kind of points. Um, for the first application, we fine tuned it again. The second application, and then talked about more through an interview process with our colleagues from the business school. On where are certain points in the practice that would would hurt them in terms of um, management, in terms of synthesis and analysis, um, and out of that, then we just developed a, a collaboration or partnership of um, engaging and developing the application together, which is very very important. We I didn't really want to develop a, a, a C grant that is purely serving an academic interest, but really joining industry problems interests with academic interests and forming out of that a partnership that has now led to the ARC Center. And we continue that. Um, we've engaged over the last six months in 17 focus groups with all the partners. And I think we've got now 40, 45 hours of, of interviews with people, um, where again, in order to form the PhD topics, we now analyze these, these discussions to really form industry problems as PhD topics that really meets the demands and the requirements of the industry partner um, underneath those six kind of goals I'll call it, I'd like to form. Thank you. That's a great segue actually um, talking about industry partner problems because I might ask you, Alec, to speak a little bit on what you see currently as the main challenges that your practice and architectural practices in general in Australia are facing in the current climate and how they maybe might relate to these themes that we've been talking about that Hank has addressed that are central to the research at the center. Well, before I do that, I just want to comment that um, I, I, I remember when, when you brought the computational design concept to, to us, and you won't say us, it was uh, Bruce Judd, Alan Peters and myself, and we thought it was really the best design program we'd seen. It was really uh, very well thought through and did hit the mark in many ways, including uh, this idea of the foundations of thinking and computational thinking in particular being integrated across many different disciplines. So, um, and, and in that sense, um, perhaps that's a segue to 
one aspect of what uh, you spoke about, which is the um, idea that we might be able to understand better how how we can buy, or how we can improve our workflows, how we can improve our uh, analytical techniques, um, how we can be more effective in the way we do things, um, but also to for create a, to to help uh, create a a workplace culture which isn't just transactional, but it is, it is also about uh, an inspirational place to come to work. And, and that embedded PhD element, I think, would be an important contribution to that culture because we are uh, one of the issues in, in the industry. Well, um, it, it's a very crowded place, it's very competitive, and um, we always feel as though we're never given enough time, space to do the work properly. And that is a huge challenge for people like me who try and set up the time and space and the money, if you like, to do things properly. And we can only do that if we, we know, if we can demonstrate the value proposition for that time and place, the time and space and and it costs a lot of things, especially if you, um, as we do, um, treat that stuff as, as really our most important asset. So in that respect, um, anything we can learn from this process, which contributes to a more creative, engaged, progressive field to the studio that gives us advancement in how we can uh, reduce the mundane tasks, improve the creative tasks, uh, make us more effective in the databases that we use. All of those things we feel um, create the sense of pride in the work we do and the sense that we we are we are working with a good place. I know that sounds a bit, bit sort of self self uh, interested, but I think it's very important for us to have. To attract the best people, and it's also very important for us to be able to convey to a, to our future clients and to our clients that we have these concerns and that we are, if you like, um, reliable and and uh, at the cutting edge of, of practice. Thank you. That was a really good answer. Um, value proposition is a word that you just use, or a term that you just use, and the term that has come up on multiple occasions throughout those focus groups. Um, and especially because we've got our business colleagues involved as well. And so they're looking at business model canvases and all sorts of stuff. And um, I think the conversations in those focus groups have very much been um, tailored to questions around how can you leverage digital tools and digital workflows to, um, as you say, automate the, the parts of the process that we don't necessarily need human creativity for and then spend more of the time on where the value proposition of your business actually is, which is your sort of response to problem solving, your response to design, how you sort of deliver these projects. And yeah, I mean, maybe if I hang a question for you then, if you could reflect on what your takeaways have been from those focus groups in terms of the key barriers to the greater uptake of digitization. Because I mean, the centre is largely focused on wanting to, you know, digitally re revolutionize the industry. So what are the things that are going to be in the way? What are, what are the sort of barriers or the stopping points there? I think it's it's very important to understand that digital is not tools, digital is a strategy. And when we talk to the, the partners about their strategy, um, or when we talk to, to architects in general about a strategy, architects are very, very good at imagining a future for the built environment. That's our job. But to imagine a future of the practice, how does your practice need to change? What kind of strategy you implement in, in order to, to change and being active versus reactive? We've heard a lot of more reactive responses. Well, if the government will ask us to do, then we do. If the client wants to have that, they want to do. So it's very interesting in the development of the grant with talking to the colleagues from the business school in in business and business strategy in, in management, you think completely different about these things. You try to form the future of your practice by being active versus by being reactive. Um, so I think that a lot of the discussions towards digital transformation 
really comes from from a discussion from well what is the, the strategy of the practice and what do you want to achieve and if you understand that then you can employ digital tools and you can make a conscious decision for example to invest in a software or buy an ARV headset or buy a robot or whatever it might be what kind of digital tools you want to pick in there um, but without that you just buy gadgets and those gadgets ends up in the cupboard after a while and you can't really use that so I think what we try to do in the center is say, well, the tools exist, they're, they're part of our kind of life, but how can you inform and bring that thinking of these tools into your practice to change the practice? And a lot of people then ask, well, then, then I have to learn computational programming and understand everything. And I think that's a misleading. I think it's, it's misleading that you need to understand something 100% in order to do it. Um, keeping in mind, if you talk on a, on a management on a director level, then you don't really understand 100% of, of a Revit tool or anything. Your role really is to change and shape the decisions towards something. So we, are, I think the overarching thing we want to do through the training at the training center, both from the PhDs and from the, the CBD courses, is enabling a digital mindset where you have an understanding maybe 30% of a certain topic. But by understanding 30% of machine learning, for example, or computation, you can start changing the way you approach a certain problem and therefore having a strategy towards delivering something differently. So I think the value proposition is really to say, well, A, having certain goals, and I think we set out those goals with those six points that I think that's very, very important in order to change what we do because we have to change them, but then developing through the center now a, a strategy of how you can achieve those goals. So it's a bit kind of taking the, the normal gun chart around and saying, well, here are my digital kind of tasks, and then I do them and then end up got a goal. It's putting a goal, so working from the right to the left of the spreadsheet, saying here are my kind of goals. How can I get, what kind of strategy can I employ in order to meet these goals? Thank you. Um, and I've got one, one final question for you, Alec, and that is a kind of future looking question. Um, around how you envision, think, hope that your practice will be impacted in five years' time with the research and the involvement uh, with our centre? Well, it's a good question following that, that description, what very clear description is about strategy versus tools. Uh, and when I think of our practice, um, I would say we've always been research focused, and from that research, We've given insight into ways of changing what we're thinking process, changing actually the framework that we've been offered. Uh, we would say for the betterment of, of the world, but also for the betterment of our client, usually. And it's that um, analytical process, it's that data driven process that has characterized a lot of our work and has led to, let's say, changes in the way things are done. Then we, we would think for the better because laws have changed and things like that have changed. Um, so the the idea of being able to do that more effectively is extremely appealing. And an analogy is the medical profession, which um, has been transformed by the extraordinary way that we can uh, analyze the body through various new technologies. And the technology is not important; it's what we do with it. And so from my point of view, uh, the work we're doing now at that large urban scale is so much more interesting because uh, when I look at all the um, material that we've been able to harness in much more rapid time, um, ideas come out of it about how it might be a better place one way or another, and it's evidence-based, and that makes it more compelling when you're advocating for a design process. The other side of it, that's historically one of our cultural traits, if you like, is this idea of precision um, around, perhaps not precision is not the best word, but this idea of how we put buildings together, how we use materials wisely, how we are designing for disassembly now, much more certainly as much as for assembly, and, and all the complexities of, of um, Producing something as a digital twin of what's can be built, if you like, and producing it in, in an abstract way uh, and being built, as was the case with one of those buildings, well, both of them, particularly the first one, built basically in Austria, 
be sent over by boat and everything had to be done in advance. Now, I'm attracted to that there's a huge amount of labour in it. Uh, it's, it's, it's really hard to design um, without a level of detail um, that we have done in the past uh, and the time and money pressure we're given to them. And that to me is a, a great challenge and I personally don't like buildings out of packets. I prefer them to be really thoughtfully considered in every respect. And I th I'm absolutely certain that we will improve our performance in this area and also make it more interesting for people to be working at this level by, by, the, by the ways we engage with you. Yeah, no, it's, um, I think when you, when you describe the, the, the project behind us here, and I remember we, we talked a fair bit in, in engagements about the, the, the challenges of, of designing or just to know what to design before it's built, because you have to very precisely explain the machine, the CNC mill that just cuts the timber later, um, what is going on, because you can't really afford any kind of errors on the construction side, so bringing the whole planning process before. And I think that's a, a very, very interesting point and, and, and focus, I think, from the centre to allow more simulation of the building, not simulation in its performance, but simulation of its build process as well. Then nearly to the screw at the end, you could you understand where the screw goes, what it, what it means in terms of scheduling, in terms of cost, in terms of carbon and so on. And very, very recently, I just discovered a book, um, How Big Things Get Done, and Ivana laughed because I forced her to read the book. And hey, well, you should all read it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so, so would you, the question I always ask with the kind of book, Frank Gehry, everybody knows Frank Gehry. Do you think Frank Gehry's projects are delivered on budget and on time? Okay. So, you know the only ones? Not the only ones. Um, I think any project since the Walt Disney Concert Hall was delivered on project and on time. So the Guggenheim Museum on budget on time. Before, before time, sorry, yeah. and probably before budget, which is very surprising because you think that's so complex, the architecture is so complex, they must have blown out the money left, right and center and never finished on time. And what the book argued there in the interviews of Frank Gehry is really the factor of simulating and planning your building before you, you build it. And it makes sense, you know, planning time costs money, yes, but it probably costs less money than, than putting out a shuffle and digging a hole in the ground and then designing or altering the project while the construction is in work already. And we've got a wonderful example here in Sydney that, where they just exactly did that, um, the Sydney Opera House. The Sydney Opera House, the construction was started before they actually knew how to design or fabricate the building. So you can see two kind of examples of, of approach um, I'm not really sure what Gary's approach exactly is. Um, the book describes it a little bit, but not in detail. Um, but it'd be very, very interesting to find out what, what digital tools could play a role there. Um, particularly the idea if you have a certain problem and you've got a strategy towards is doing something, and you have then the means not to rely on tools that have been given to you. Because keep in mind all the tools that uh, a company like Autodesk gives to you is not designed for your problem, it's designed for a mass market. So you just do something that just meets as many people as possible. And I think through computation, you get a chance to say, well, if I got a problem that only concerns me, I can design a tool for my specific problem. So understanding the relationship between uh, planning and simulating items before, um, and if you can't simulate or plan something and you don't have the tool for that, design your own tool because um, it, it's easy to design tools if you've got the programming skills. Um, all the, the packages are there. We trained it to our students to design their own tools, and I think it's it's doable for practice as well because our students are in practice and developing tools for practice. Great, thank you. Um, well, I might open up to the floor for any questions if you have any questions for us. Awesome. <laughs> Um, practice compared to GHPs. Right, can you tell us a little bit more about how that's gonna? Oh, oh my goodness. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about how that's gonna work? Yes. Um, 
So all the students will be embedded in practice. We've got a long history in the, the ASC centers through Mark Burry, who started the embedded PhD model in the early 2000s um, here in Australia. The PhD model of embedded PhD got then exported into Europe through our international partners, um, CETA, Bartlett, and IAC, um, through an InnoChain, a European funded project of, of embedding PhD, and we bring that back now to Australia. Um, the embedded PhD project will most likely look into that it's not one PhD student sitting one firm, but there's a 21 PhD students will be placed in all the firms at various times. How they're going to be placed in the firms and when they will place in the firm is part of the PhD project. Um, so we don't really know that yet, but I think it's you, you will get as a practice more of the PhD cohort if you have several of them coming into your firm and inspecting or analyzing or reviewing a certain aspect of your of your PhD problem in the firm. Um, having a PhD embedded PhD that also would you know, allow for certain challenges, of course. So what we develop at the moment is the, the handbook of how to embed a PhD student into practice. So we're writing up a handbook that explains to the PhD student what is the expectation of a PhD, what it means to go to a practice and be embedded there, uh, what other things are in there in terms of training of, of yourself as a PhD student, but then doing the same thing for the supervisors, so the supervisors understand as well, so the postdoc fellows who've been involved in the PhD, but then also, of course, for the industry partner. Um, I had an embedded PhD student from 2012 to 2015, 16, um, who was embedded of an ARC grant in Grimshaw, Transport New South Wales and Arup. Um, and you could see the challenges there with the PhD student by just simply having you know, one person in the firm interest in the PhD student, but then in year one leaving. In year two, the second person leaves. In year three, the last person leaves. And by the time the PhD student finished their PhD, the original person with the idea was no longer there and the last person was no longer interested. Um, so there's a lot of kind of management and, and collaboration process off of embedded PhD. And we hope through the PhD handbook that we cover some of those ones or it becomes a living document that we um, can produce to help our own PhD students, but also help to understand better for industry what an embedded PhD student or PhD could look like. <laughs> Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, I'm always curious about the idea that automation is going to save us lots of time and then enable us to do all of the things that we love and want to do, like design. Um, in the industry, however, and I guess I'm directing this question firstly to Alec, if we automate and we make all of our processes far faster, what's to stop other architecture organisations then sort of um, competing on that basis. So they don't necessarily add value in back into design. They just finish the project faster and then compete on the basis that they're faster. How, how can we address that issue and protect the time that we save? Well, that's a really interesting question to talk about. Um, I don't know how to answer that, but I will say this. I don't actually think automation um, in itself um, is, is the key, um, I suppose, part of the value proposition. Um, what I think still would distinguish how we work and why we're useful is what we do with the time we have and how we uh, are better equipped to make decisions that are more effective and how we can produce better work. I, I, I'm not sure I'm, I'm answering it, but I don't. I think what counts still is the um, you know the top paddock, our brain, and not so much the automation. I mean, an example of that is with um, Iris, Iris, who, who you know, maybe, um, she's come back and she's helped us automate a whole lot of uh, urban analysis work that we're doing in a 
less automated way, I mean, often by hand, and the uh, process is liberating and it allows us to talk about it in different ways and effective ways and allows us to develop better understandings. So I think that's what's going to distinguish us. It allows that conversation to be better. So um, I wanted I want to take a moment to um, comment on something that was raised here, which I wasn't going to do. I don't think um, for, for our work, uh, we have reasonable control, contribute to reasonable control of time and, um, and uh, budget, the program and budget. Um, and, and I'm sure we can improve it. I'm sure it can be improved, but we generally don't have those. We have those problems from day one to day's end, but we manage it quite well. We don't have those huge blowouts like the Opera House, I'm sure. But I'd like to add um, a third ingredient to consider, and that is defect-free delivery. Because mm. once you add that, then time and budget is given a context. So just just for You would be part of the 0.5% of projects in the author's database that actually meet the <laughs> project budgets on time and on. on, um, on I'll tell you why we meet. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> the secret sauce. <laughs> um, any final questions? Okay, well, we might wrap the session up then. Um, just like to thank Alec for joining us today and. Hank, and uh, we'll see you all at some point soon. <laughs> see you next time.